Okay, my name is Anna Cates. I'm an extension specialist at the University of Minnesota Extension. I built this presentation with my colleague Jody Young Hughes, a regional extension educator. She and I have been working with the Minnesota Corn Growers Funded Project for the last year or so uh, called Carbon Smart, where we try to give education like this about carbon practices. So I'm happy to be here today, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the science of carbon in the soil, why it sticks around, uh, what practices might change carbon in the soil, and what chance we have to sequester carbon. Um, on the scale that the carbon markets are suggesting. I'm a soil scientist by training. I did my grad school over in Wisconsin and then came here to Minnesota. So I have a, a strong upper Midwest bias. And I want to talk a little bit about what that means in terms of soil carbon. So soil carbon, this is a map of soil carbon across the U.S. The darker colors represent higher carbon. And here we are in the upper Midwest, especially in Minnesota, with really high organic matter soils already. Uh, the other thing we're dealing with in Minnesota is that we have this short growing season, and this, of course, extends beyond the little bubble that I have there, but bear with me on this particular uh, uh, range for now. So we've got cold climate. There's a snow falling outside as I speak. And that means that we have less time to plant our cash crops. But because of that rich, uh, high organic matter soil, we also have really high yield potential in Minnesota as we do across much of the Corn Belt. And so we can grow those really high yielding corn and soybean crops, but we have less time to do it in. And that means that our logistics are a little tighter. And it also means we just have less time to grow things. And how much time you have to grow things is the beginning of the carbon cycle, essentially. And that's why it's relevant to the carbon markets. So here's a reminder of the processes behind the soil carbon numbers. Essentially, this figure shows inputs of carbon from photosynthesis through the plant into the soil. We'll talk a little bit more about how that works. And then outputs from the soil are primarily microbial respiration and decomposition. So that's leaving the soil as carbon dioxide. You also have outputs of harvest, and so you still you do uh, remove some carbon when you are uh, removing your grain or your residue, your stover, whatever it is you're uh, pulling off from the plant. So carbon is coming into the system from photosynthesis and leaving basically through harvest and through microbial breakdown of that plant product into carbon dioxide. Okay, so what do we do if we want to change the amount of carbon in the soil? We need to think about that carbon balance. We either need to increase what's going in, the photosynthetic inputs, or we need to reduce outputs or, or slow the process of changing organic carbon into carbon dioxide in order to keep carbon in the soil. These are some of the options. Uh, you know, you could certainly go crazy with different ones, but these are some of the basic options for changing your carbon inputs and outputs. Uh, to increase inputs, you can leave your residue in place. Uh, you can think about higher biomass crops. So the crops that produce more biomass are, are essentially pulling more carbon into the system. And I'll show some data on that in just a minute here. The other thing you can think about is strategic inputs. You know, you don't necessarily just want to grow a corn with tons and tons more residue. Maybe you want to think about growing a corn that has more roots because roots are in contact with the soil and tend to be stabilized as soil carbon. That's why we have such rich soils in the Midwest in the first place. A lot of that is due to the, the thick roots of the prairie plants that left a lot of carbon behind. Another strategic way to add inputs is to use cover crops because those inputs are coming at a different time of year relative to your annual warm season cash crops of corn and soybeans. I should say, I know this webinar is going out to a larger region and some people are probably growing things besides corn and soybeans, but I think that focusing on corn and soybeans is relevant because they're some of the most difficult parts of the rotation to increase carbon um, and add a cover crop. So now I'm going to uh, talk about a couple of these strategies in more detail in the next few slides. So this figure shows a carbon balance, and it's based on some sites in uh, near the cities and also in West Central Minnesota from my friend Josh Gamble's research. This data is from carbon going in and out as measured by eddy covariance towers uh, between 2007 and 2015. And the way you read this figure is that each 
uh, uh, rectangle here represents a crop, alfalfa, grain maize, silage maize, and soybean. The blue bars on top of the line represent the inputs to the system, the photosynthetic inputs or anything that's added in terms of carbon. The yellow represents what's lost from the system, harvest and microbial respiration, like I talked about before. And then the red bar simply means the blue minus the yellow. So that's the balance, gains minus losses. And to go through this crop by crop, you'll notice that most of our red bars, most of our final balance are right near zero or just under it. The outlier in that realm is silage maze. And that's because of the increase in harvested carbon. So more of the carbon that's produced by the system is removed by the harvest process. Anybody who's harvested silage could have told me that, I'm sure. But that leads to a, a more negative carbon balance in this system. You see that uh, a lot of the systems are producing pretty similarly, but soybean produces a little less. You also uh, respire a little less in soybean because the microbes are respiring a lot of, of what's going in. And so you don't end up too much more negative in soybean relative to grain maize or alfalfa. Here's a little more data from Josh's study. Uh, the two graphs on the right show uh, a couple of ways of looking at the data to understand when carbon balance is higher relative to lower. So on top, this figure shows the relationship between residue carbon, so that's carbon that's photosynthesized but not removed from the system, and the carbon balance. So the carbon balance is, again, this, this red number. So the residue carbon is lowest in the silage maize system, this black triangle, and it's highest in the grain maize system. And you see our carbon balance is the most positive, approaching zero, uh, in systems where we have a lot of residue. And that's a real clear relationship. There's a lot of work showing that if you want to increase your soil carbon or just maintain your soil carbon, because a carbon balance of zero means net neutral carbon. That means you're not losing any carbon and you're not gazing, gaining any carbon. So you need to keep residue on the surface and not harvest it if you want to um, uh, even get to zero. The other figure here is a little more interesting, especially perhaps to this livestock crowd. Here, the x-axis is the ratio between manure carbon in and the harvested carbon out. And this is very relevant for a, a silage rotation with alfalfa or something like that, where you're probably putting manure in even as you're harvesting a lot of feed um, a lot of residue for feed. So essentially what we're saying is how much of the harvested carbon can we replace with manure? And the highest values in this study are around half. So around half of the carbon that's harvested as silage maize in this case was able to be replaced with manure carbon. And then again, we're essentially approaching zero in these systems. So note that in our, our most of our cash crop systems in these upper Midwest climates, our carbon balance is right around zero. We are at best neutral. And so we're not losing a lot of carbon, uh, but we're definitely not on a trajectory to gain carbon in our standard cropping systems. The next kind of practice I'm going to talk about is cover crops, and I have a little data from uh, my PhD work in Wisconsin and a little data from Josh's study on this slide. So on the left, I just wanted to show these yellow and blue bars to show the difference in productivity between corn and cover crop. So the net primary productivity refers to all of the biomass produced by the plant over these three different growing seasons, so 2015, 16, and 17. And the yellow is the corn and the blue is the cover crop. We had a bluegrass cover crop, which is kind of an oddball, uh, the kind of perennial living cover that we had between rows. And then we also had cereal rye, a much more standard um, cover crop for the upper Midwest. And I just wanted you to notice that the cover crop is rarely a significant portion of the total photosynthesized carbon for the year. Here in the year where we had the best cover crop and relatively low productivity corn, it was up to about 25% of the total productivity. Uh, and this was in the silage system. Sorry, I didn't point that out, but the lower row are numbers for silage corn net primary productivity and upper row is grain net primary productivity. 
In Josh's study here in Minnesota on the right, they only had one year with a cover crop, but because of their measuring system, again, the Eddy Covariance Tower, they're ever able to measure daily whether the system is pulling in more carbon from the atmosphere or respiring more carbon. So every day they're able to say, are we doing more respiration, more decomposition, or more photosynthesis? And they started in the fall measuring a blue rye maize system, that's these blue dots, and also a maize system without cover crops. So in the fall, everything is negative, showing that respiration is happening. This is natural in the case of a system where photosynthesis has slowed down because it's colder. Plus, there's probably nothing growing there in this annual cropping system where maize uh, you know, has been harvested or is not photosynthesizing anymore at this time. <laughs> The rye is planted here in late September, and you do get to a positive carbon balance for a short period um, uh, here in the late fall with the rye photosynthesizing faster than the microbes are respiring carbon. Winter is pretty well neutral, nothing much is happening. As the microbes start to wake up in the spring, you see that the balance dips negative in the red dots with no cover crop. And in the blue dots, the balance dips positive because the rye, again, is photosynthesizing. And anybody who's grown cereal rye knows how fast it can grow in the spring. You have higher carbon um, uh, production here in the spring than you did in the fall. Better temperatures, better conditions for that rye to, to take off. Uh, the rye is terminated and maize is planted and everything dips negative for a while here. The rye actually dips more negative because there's more fresh green residue there uh, for that system to, or for the microbes to decompose. And so there's a little more for microbes to chew on, so it dips a little more negative here. And then the last piece of the carbon balance you can see over the course of the years, you can actually see that the photosynthesis in maize or the degree of the, the level of positive carbon um, production in maize with the rye following the rye is a little bit less. So corn yield took a hit this year in this system. However, if you added up the forage value of this rye, because it was harvested for forage here, uh, with the silage that was produced, it overall produced a, a relatively similar amount of forage. And it's gaining a little bit of carbon relative to the system without maize. So uh, here, there's, there's definitely some trade-offs where you could see that lower productivity in your corn crop following your rye, uh, but you could see this positive carbon balance during the times of the year when an annual cropping system basically has no chance to fix carbon into the system. On a global scale, uh, carbon and cover crops has been studied widely, and I want to point out this global meta-analysis, which broke down the response of soil carbon to cover crops by different cover crop biomass levels. So at the bottom is less than three megagrams per hectare per year, and up on here is, is greater than seven megagrams per hectare per year. And let's see, actually, if we go back to my study, we see that we were way lower than that. We were um, peaking at less than half of a megagram per hectare per year. And that's pretty common in my experience of, of cover crop use in the upper Midwest is that you're at less than a megagram per hectare or, or a ton per acre of biomass if you're thinking in, in English units. So that just means that your error bars are a lot larger in terms of your likelihood of increasing carbon in the system. And you're going to increase your carbon, soil carbon, a lot less relative to systems where you're growing over seven micrograms per hectare per year of, of biomass and cover crops, which I think is, is quite the, the dream for the, the upper Midwest. OK. So next, I want to talk about the, the reason that there are some strategic inputs to carbon in the soil. And this is going to get a little bit more into nerdy carbon cycling and microbial processes. Essentially, the roots in contact with the soil uh, don't just sit there and they don't just feed the microbes when they die. Instead, they're in active engagement with the microbes throughout the plant growing um, growing life. So here, this is a picture of a, a root tip, and around it are all these active microbes. Here's a picture I took of just a, a plant in the field with a bunch of soil clinging to the roots. Those soil clinging to the roots are held together with the sort of sloughed off plant cells, which 
microbes are eating and chewing on and uh, turning into available nutrients again. Um, they're called root exudates a lot. So the microbial community is really rich right next to the plant roots. And that is not only beneficial to the plant in terms of providing nutrients in the form the plant can take up, but it's also important for soil carbon because it's pumping carbon into those microbes. And that's sort of the beginning of carbon being stuck in the soil for a long time. So when you think about carbon being stuck in the soil for a long time, I want to point out that this is sort of a, a process that the carbon is on. It's not like it's either in the soil, carbon is not either in the soil or not in the soil. It's always evolving from one form, fresh residue, into uh, different microbes. It's existing inside larger organisms like worms or little invertebrates that live there. It's existing in biofilms of microbes. It has a lot of different forms. And so the soil organisms are constantly processing the carbon. And when you think of carbon stabilized in the soil, you should actually think of it actively moving through a food web of different kinds of organisms. So it's always transforming and because these processes are biological, the temperature, the moisture, and the soil texture uh, alter the processes. Soil texture is important because it gets at uh, what kind of space these organisms have to live in. Are there big pores with lots of uh, water but not very much air? Are there uh, or I'm sorry, big pores with lots of air and less water or the opposite that changes uh, who can live there and how fast carbon is changed in the soil. Okay, so here's a reminder of the processes be behind the carbon numbers that we're talking about. And the, we've talked a little bit about inputs, how photosynthesis and um, brings carbon into the soil and how we can sort of strategize around our management of plant photosynthesis as agricultural managers. Uh, outputs are a lot more difficult to strategize around. We can't really change the microbes. The things that drastically slow the microbes down are really um, not things things that we want to do. So these, uh, these bottom two bullet points, making the environment less favorable to microbes, such as making it very cool and wet or very hot and dry, those are going to have terribly adverse consequences for your above ground <laughs> activities, for your, your farming activities, let's say. And so the only real thing I'm going to talk about in terms of reducing outputs to increase carbon is around tillage and soil structure. So I talked about how pore size and soil texture could affect where soil organisms can live, but aggregates or the next level up of soil structure are actually even, even more important in terms of uh, giving habitat to a lot of different kinds of organisms and particularly to uh, fungi in the soil because fungi are long and stringy and so tillage tends to disturb them. Uh, fungi also move around more in the soil by, by growing those hyphae out, whereas microbes, uh, bacteria will just sort of stay in one place. So when you think about aggregates, um, you should think about essentially a snowball with really heterogeneous materials inside. So this is a, a large aggregate that has some stringy roots and some stringy fungal hyphae, some maybe bits of corn residue or a little, um, little uh, dead beetles and stuff inside of it. And then it also has little films around these that you could think of as just sticky glue layers of dead cells and basically unorganized uh, organic particles. And it's important that this all sticks together because then the microbes that are outside this aggregate cannot decompose the stuff inside of it. This aggregate also lend, uh, changes the water behavior of the soil substantially. So when you have an aggregate, you have the possibility for water to flow around it and for water to be stored inside of it. And so that's, that's a, a sort of sidebar function of having these aggregates for carbon protection. When you till, you expose a lot more organic matter to microbial uh, uh, degradation. I'm going to talk a little bit about some nerdy issues with carbon management, because I think as we're trying to better understand carbon markets, it's important to uh, evaluate the studies out there and how effectively they measure soil carbon. So we see a lot of different data around whether soil carbon is likely to increase or decrease with different practices, and I, I think it's likely to do with some sloppy measurement habits that we are in. 
So this slide shows how carbon accrual needs to be measured over time. So if you think of each of these blue and um, yellow dots as a pair, where you could go out to a field and sample this field and find more carbon than this car uh, than uh, the next field, uh, and that happens in each case. But it matters where these two fields started. So if these two fields started up here and you come along and sample, they've both lost carbon, even if what you see is an increase in the yellow relative to the blue. If the two fields started here, then what's happened is that the yellow is stable and the blue has lost carbon. Again, you're seeing the same difference between yellow and blue. And if you start with this dot and you measure these two dot, uh, blue and yellow systems, then one is accruing and one is stable. But you need that baseline measurement in order to understand whether two fields which look different are actually accruing, losing, or just stable in soil carbon. And it looks like my title came up last, but you can see the point here, I think. The other piece is making sure that people are measuring soil mass. Soil organic matter is commonly referred to as a percent, uh, and that is a concentration. You take a percent of soil carbon and multiply it by the mass of soil, which is measured using bulk density, to get the total stocks or megagrams per hectare of carbon. So in each of these scenarios, you have uh, the same two grams of carbon per centimeter squared. So it's about 2% SOC or uh, maroon dots relative to the yellow dots. But where we have compacted over here, you can see that you could actually measure deeper um, and get more soil because it is compacted. And you would appear to have more carbon in the system, even though you've actually just sampled more soil because the mass is more dense and it is uh, deeper. So if people tell you that they have a higher percent carbon, that's great for a lot of the functions that we're interested in, like uh, increasing aggregation and microbial cycling, but it's not helpful in terms of carbon sequestration and a, a worldwide carbon balance. Uh, and this is just a platform that I like called agevidence.org, which show these really interesting um, compilations of studies across the Midwest. And here you can see that relative to all their observations of cover crops, so carbon usually doesn't much change. And in all their comparisons between no-till and conventional, there's a small increase in uh, carbon with that practice. Uh, but no-till often just sequesters carbon in the very top part of the soil. So I encourage you to go into this Ag Evidence platform and maybe you can find a study near your uh, site that you're interested in and get a better sense of, of what might be possible where you are. Uh, but be aware that there's kind of a whole range of different possible outcomes when you compare a no-till versus a conventional or a cover crop versus a no cover cropped field. I will wrap up there. Thank you for listening. My contact information is here. Please get in touch if anything didn't make sense today. I put a couple of resources on here. One is a more practical guide to different carbon markets. Uh, it's about a year old, but I think it's still really relevant. And then a link to that ag evidence platform. Thanks for listening. Have a good day.